66, your Erie.com special report. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Wilk. We interrupt our programming to bring you a special report, an update on the spread of COVID-19 in Erie County. We go live to the studios of WQLN-TV. Here is Erie County Executive Kathy Dahlkemper. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me on this Saturday afternoon as we speak about the COVID-19 pandemic in Erie County. We have one new confirmed positive case of COVID-19 in Erie County, which takes us to a total of 20 positive cases. We have 573 total negative cases. The individual that I'm talking about today is in their 40s, and the investigations are underway by the Erie County Department of Health to determine contacts for that individual. In the state, the numbers today are a staggering 10,017 positives with 136 deaths. This is a 1,597 increase in the cases that are positive and 34 more deaths in the last 24 hours. Included in these numbers are one case in Warren County and five cases in Crawford County. And our neighbors to the west in Ashtabula County have 11 cases, and to the east, Chautauqua County in New York has 10 cases. So we all must please continue to do what we know works, and that is our social distancing, or as I'd like to refer to it as physical distancing, keeping ourselves at least six feet away from any individual who does not live in our home. This is the way that we stop the spread of COVID-19 throughout our community, throughout our nation. Please stay at home unless you absolutely must go out. And when you go out, please take every possible precaution. As we were instructed by the governor yesterday, that now includes wearing a mask. If you must leave your home, wear a mask when you are shopping at essential businesses like a grocery store or a pharmacy, when visiting a health care provider if you are told by that health care provider to come in for a physical visit, when using public transportation to get to one of these life sustaining essential businesses, when interacting with customers if you are the person working at an essential business, and certainly if you are at all feeling sick coughing, sneezing, but I prefer in those cases that you actually do always stay home. So we will wear masks because mine will protect you and your mask will protect me, but you have to understand that my wearing a mask does not protect me against what I might be doing and how I could pick up that virus. So again, Wearing a mask because mine will protect you and yours will pre protect me, but these do not protect us from ourselves. So as I've been talking about washing your hands, making sure you don't touch your face, all of those things are still things we need to do. So let me talk just a little bit about masks. We've all probably learned a lot in the last 24 hours about masks, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So this is what we call your N95 mask. These, you have to know, are in extremely short supply and must be left for use from our first responders and our health care workers. These are very good masks and very good at protecting people, particularly when or they are in the highest risk situations. And if they don't have enough masks of these type, then they could potentially get sick and won't be for us. They are for us when we need them. So if you have these masks, you should be giving them to our first responders and to our health care workers and not be wearing these if you're just a citizen do it going about your average day. Secondly, we have a surgical mask, which I think all of us have seen if we've ever gone uh, to have any kind of surgery. Obviously, it goes on your face and they tie it. Again, these are in short supply and most of us should not be wearing these. 
They should be left, again, for our health care workers and people that are in the highest risk situations because of the work they're doing for us right now. There is one exception, and that's for people that have a compromised immune system and their physicians have told them to wear these. It might be someone undergoing chemotherapy, for example, potentially someone with MS or some other underlying disease where their physician said, if you have to go out, wear a surgical mask. But otherwise, they're in short supply, and again, they should be worn by our first responders and our health care workers. A third kind of mask, which we're hearing a lot more about, is one that's handmade. This one my friend made, and I uh, gave it to me. Fits right over my face with these elastics going over my ears. And so if you uh, would like to make your own mask, we have uh, instructions on the EriCountyPA.gov website. Uh, you can find it on the Pennsylvania Department of Health website. And there's many, many uh, different scenarios out there for how to make your own mask. And then finally, if you really don't feel like you can even sew your own mask or have somebody can do it, there's always the old bandana or a scarf. This helps also. Tie it over your face, go to the store. Um, you don't have to wear it when you're driving, just once you get to the store and you're going in. So the mask, as I said, is important because if I was a carrier of COVID-19, and we know that there are probably 25 to 30 percent of the people, studies are showing, that are carriers and they don't even know it, um, then when I would speak and any water droplets would come out of my mouth, they wouldn't go anywhere that would infect you, and, or neither if you were a positive carrier and didn't know it, you wouldn't be affecting me. So please wear your mask when you're out in public in any place outside of your home or outside of your car when you're with other people. So which one to wear we've gone over and how to make them yourself. As I said, there's lots of things available to help you find ways to make your own mask. So thank you for following the guidelines, for staying at home as always, for keeping that physical distance from one another, and for practicing good personal hygiene, including not touching your face and again, when you're wearing that mask, don't touch your face until you have a chance to wash your hands well or put hand sanitizer on them. Our Environmental Task Force now received 77 complaints yesterday, but only a couple of calls overnight, so we are seeing that decreasing. The team continues to uh, be out doing field inspections when necessary, but many of the complaints, we call the business, we find out that they are a life-sustaining business, and we just help them continue to do things in the best way that they can. We know that many people recognize Palm Sunday tomorrow, which is uh, a, a holy day, uh, a day of, I should say, holiness in the Christian church. And as I shared yesterday, our environmental team encourages everyone to participate in a way that does not require people to gather. That's where the problems are, when people gather. So if a church is doing some kind of a palm uh, distribution through into your vehicle, that is uh, what we really do recommend. If you need any information or guidance, please ch check under the resources under our COVID-19 page on the EriCountyPA.gov website. And as always, there's plenty of material there. And you can always call 451-6700 or e email us at ecdhinfo, I-N-F-O, at EriCountyPA.gov. And as a reminder, next week is Public Health Week. Please join me in showing appreciation for our public health service workers by writing an email to them of thanks at ecdhinfo at eriecountypa.gov or send them a note, a personal note in the mail to 606 West 2nd Street, Erie, Pennsylvania, 16507. I don't think we can thank them and so many other people in our community enough for all that they're doing during this very, very difficult time. And now I'd like to open it up to the media for questions. And we will start today with the Erie Times News. Oh, hi, Kathy. This is uh, Ron Leonardi. Um, I know yesterday you issued directives on the uh, safe distribution of palms on, on Sunday. And I know Bishop Persico uh, later yesterday went, on, went kind of one step further and announced that he is advising parishes not to distribute palms tomorrow. Was that decision kind of a pleasant surprise from, from your standpoint? 
You know, we, we gave instructions of how we thought it could be done safely, but obviously the best thing is for people to stay home. And I know this is going to be a very unusual Holy Week for any of us who are Christian. Uh, this is always the holiest of weeks in our faith and uh, tradition, and Palm Sunday starts that week. So it was a difficult decision, I'm sure, that the bishop made. But honestly, I think it's the right decision, because the more, again, we can keep people at home, I think the safer our community will be. How about uh, Talk Erie? Are you with us today? Yes, good afternoon. It's Joel. Hi. Yesterday I had asked the question about rules for big box stores. We had been getting reports about the workers at those stores getting abused by Erie uh, citizens regarding not having access to the toy aisle or the clothing aisle. Do you have any uh, new data for us? So I did check into the box stores, and uh, even though most of those stores have uh, groceries and other life-sustaining items in them, they have, uh, for the most part, roped off the areas which are not considered in that life-sustaining category. And that would be things like toys and um, maybe electronics and clothing and, and those kind of things. And, and I can understand why that might frustrate some customers going in there. But we are trying to minimize why people are in a store. So they should be going in there to buy groceries or to maybe be buying some pharmaceutical items. They have pharmacies often in those stores also. And those should be the only reason why you go into those big box stores, as we like to refer them to. And I want to thank our local stores for doing the right thing and trying to control the numbers of people that come into their stores. So if they are limiting what you can go buy, it's because that's what the state has requested of them. So all of this closure of businesses and limiting of what's sold in businesses and uh, businesses that are allowed to be open but must be compliant, that was all done through the governor's office, along with the Department of Community and Economic Development. Uh, any waivers were done by the state. But please be respectful and be compassionate with the people who are working there. Because those people probably would prefer to be home every day where they know they're safer. But they're out working in those stores for you so that you can get the groceries you need and the medicines you need. And, and so I ask all of us to practice compassion with every person that we come in contact with to know that we're all in this together and we should all understand that every one of us who's out there is putting ourselves at risk, particularly those people who are working at those stores. How about Erie News Now? Uh, Kathy, this is Lisa Adams. Um, I wanted to ask about the all the surgical masks for the N95 masks. If someone has a supply of those for maybe a prior medical condition or someone gave you some of those, is it really possible to turn those over to health care workers or would there be issues with them being clean or sterile or where they've been? So if you have a supply of these uh, N95 masks, um, you can call us at the Public Safety Building because we are um, responsible through our um, emergency management uh, group of passing masks like this out to healthcare workers. And they'd be maybe people in um, a nursing home or people working in some of our residential care facilities where people are there because maybe of drug addiction and uh, mental health issues and things like that. So th there are a wide range of facilities in our community who need these masks and those people are putting themselves at danger every day coming to work. So I would ask that you um, contact us in county government um, and see if they're acceptable for us to uh, take your supply because I know uh, some construction companies, for example, have these masks in supply because they use them to protect their employees when they're sawing something that might be throwing up dust and, and things like that. So we have gotten some uh, brought forward from construction companies. And, and that's, um, I think, one of the areas where we do find uh, some, some out in the community have these masks and they know how badly they're needed. So certainly we'll take them. Obviously, if they've been used, uh, then we wouldn't be uh, using them again. But if they're clean and they're unused, fresh, uh, they can be used by others now who really need them. So thanks for that question. And just a follow-up to that, um, there was an article somewhere else in the state about one of our local nursing homes, the Twinbrook Nursing Home, and people there not having adequate supplies and resources to do their jobs. 
Um, what can you tell us about Twin Brook Nursing Home and the uh, the situation there? And and are there concerns related to COVID nineteen? Do they have any uh, a case or an instance there that's exacerbating this? Or or what do you know about whether they're just looking ahead? Uh, to as the far as I is? know, uh, the concern would be just what we see across the, the nation, no specific concerns in our community right now. But we know that any place where people are living in congregate care, whether that be a nursing home, whether that be maybe our home for people with intellectual disabilities, some group homes that we have in our community, and as I mentioned, what we call residential treatment facilities, uh, even our prison, any place where people are living in congregate situations, uh, if COVID-19 would enter that facility, that could be uh, devastating. And we saw that, of course, first in Washington State. So they all need to have these types of masks to protect themselves and to protect the people that they're treating. So um, we yesterday um, got a supply in, and we got that supply right out. And much, much of that supply, from what I understand, went to nursing homes in our community yesterday. So my emergency management personnel have been doing a great job with trying to track down supplies of both the N95 and the surgical masks. And as soon as we get them in, we are getting them out to our community partners. And we uh, expect that we will be very busy doing that next week too as we think we have more masks potentially coming um, in and some supplies. So that's the good news is that we're finding um, some supplies of these masks in different places and, and that we're actually getting them out to the entities that really need them in Erie County. And I hope to have a much more comprehensive uh, report on that next week with even maybe some numbers as how many masks we're getting out there. How about um, WJET-TV? Yeah, hi, Kathy, it's Samir. So I wanted to talk about Walmart. So yesterday we know nationally they're starting uh, new protocols and safety measures for their shoppers. So I guess, is there a concern uh, with having shoppers waiting outside? I know they're supposed to stay six feet while they're waiting to go inside, but I guess, does that concern you having uh, like a decent sized crowd like that waiting outside of the store? I'm not as concerned as if they're six feet apart and they're outside. Um, outside is better than inside. And so obviously with the weather nicer, it's a little bit easier to keep your crowds outside. But if you were a person who's really concerned, um, you know, I even talked to my husband about this. Um, I said, you know, I think we should actually do our shopping in more off hours. And since hopefully we're all staying home, maybe there's the ability for us to spread out um, and not come in when, they're so, when the crowds are big. And if I pulled up to a Walmart and there were a lot of people there or any other store, grocery store, um, any other uh, box store, I would turn around and leave. And then I'd come back at another time when there's less people there. It's up to us individually to protect ourselves and to protect our family. And if you're not comfortable with the number of people that you see there, go back at a different time when the crowds will be much less. But it does concern me, but I'm glad that Walmart is trying to do their best to keep people separated. And of course, they have big areas, big parking lots, and um, they should be able to do that, uh, especially with the weather being nice like this. And then I have a follow-up as well, just uh, since we're speaking of crowds. I know I've received... Uh, a few questions on my page regarding trout season and fishermen and women just in general. Do you know, uh, is there any special protocols, I guess, being implemented? Are we still moving forward with trout season, the initial uh, starting date for that? So I believe trout season will start in a couple weeks. Um, I talked to um, the head of the Fish and Boat Commission actually a couple weeks ago about trout season and about charter fishing and, and just a number of the other issues that we were concerned about up here in Erie County. Um, they have a great graphic that shows a fisherman standing with a pole uh, stretched out and another fisherman or woman uh, just beyond that pole. So, you know, getting that six foot distance from each other if you are along the shore anywhere fishing is obviously uh, imperative. But I, I, don't, I don't fish myself, but I know a lot of people who do. But one of the great things that this gentleman told me from the Fish and Game Commission is he said that the steelhead season is basically over. And that is the season when we see all of those people in our creeks, and they're often you know, right next to each other. And he said that season is, is pretty much done. 
He said trout season, uh, when they stalk the trout, is pretty much a localized crowd because they do this stock, trout stocking across the whole Commonwealth, so people don't really need to leave their own community to find trout like they do with steelhead. So it's pretty much Erie County people fishing in our, uh, our streams and in our uh, areas for the trout. Now, he said they were still going to figure out what they were going to do about trout season this year, and um, I haven't heard back from him. So I expect that we will be getting some guidance from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission uh, very shortly about what they're deciding to do about trout season, because we know we have some areas where you can get some pretty big crowds, Frontier Park being one, and out at Presque Isle, um, around the waterworks area. There can be quite a few there. A lot of kids come out with their parents and their grandparents and it's always a nice day but obviously way too close proximity to each other. So we'll wait and hear from the Fish and Boat Commission about that. But I feel a little bit better knowing that uh, we won't be attracting people coming in from outside of other, other areas usually to our community for trout season. Uh, Erie Times News. Uh, Kathy, on the latest uh, positive county case, uh, do you have any information on the condition of that person? Do you know if they were hospitalized or, or if they're quarantining at home or any of the circumstances involving how they may have contracted the virus? So of the 20 cases we have, there's only um, been one hospitalized to my knowledge, and that was not this case. This case, my understanding is, uh, as I said, someone in their 40s and they are convalescing um, at home. and. Um, okay. We expect, hopefully, that they'll have a full recovery in their own home. Did, did I answer your whole question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, talk Erie? Yes, hi. Uh, Kathy, when I interviewed uh, Melissa Lyon, the public health director, on my radio show yesterday, she indicated that she would desire a lot more testing in Erie County. And my question to you is, you know, when you go on your statewide conference calls and things, how are you able to advocate for more testing for Erie? Because we're still hearing that it is a huge jump for even family members of known positives to get a test. And, and of course, the numbers are dribs and drabs that they're coming into Erie County. Can you talk about, you know, the, advo the advocacy that you can do? So the testing that we are doing here I wouldn't say is any worse, certainly no better than any place else. This is a problem across the nation. And so when I get on calls with other county executives from across the nation, every one of us is saying the same thing. Every community wants more testing, but there simply are not enough ca test cases in this country. And so I can advocate and advocate, but there aren't enough test kits for anywhere. And, you know, um, so when we say, you know, that we have only had, um, what did I say, 573 negatives and we have 20 positives, so we're talking, um, you know, just about 600 tests total, a little less than that, um, we want many more tests than that. And it's important to remember that these tests are not run by the public health department. They are run by our health care providers. So our uh, UPMC, uh, Allegheny Health Network, St. Vincent, LECOM, and some private doctors are doing the tests. We don't do them at the health department. And of course you would understand you'd have to be very um, well garbed and protecting uh, the people who are giving the test. But those health care uh, facilities would like more tests too. And there's just again not enough test kits uh, swabs, reagents, all of the things that you need to have a proper test and to get those results. There's just not enough in our country. And so uh, 50 states, all the territories, the District of Columbia, everybody's asking for more tests and we don't have them here. And it is uh, unfortunate that we found ourselves in this place as the pandemic came forward, but it is the reality of our national um, unpreparedness for a pandemic. So just as a follow-up, you would say that we are not getting a short shrift of getting tests here in Erie County because we don't have the, the booming um, positives? No, I don't think we're getting the short end of the stick compared to anywhere else. I just don't think there's enough tests to go around. And so um, because there's not enough tests, uh, when someone tests positive in their home, 
and then a few days later someone else in their home has the symptoms of COVID-19, we just say, yes, you have COVID-19, um, you need to isolate and stay in your home. Um, I mean, we, we don't call them a positive because they're not in our numbers, but if they would call and they're, they would talk to their physician, I'm assuming, but they would say, there's no sense in wasting, I hate to say that wasting, but you know, you, I should say using up a test on someone who is almost for sure positive because they live with somebody who's positive, then maybe to find out another person in another home is positive who doesn't live with anybody and now we've now we've protected a whole new group of people because those people living in the home with the person who's COVID positive have also signed a form saying they agree to be quarantined for 14 days in that home because they've had that personal close contact with that individual. So they should already be in a place where our community is protected from them and uh, so if they become positive it's no greater risk to our community if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that's actually new information. Uh, Erie News now? Yeah, to follow up on what you were just saying to Jay, uh, um, to Joel, but I have my own question too. Um, so if, if a lot of people who have been exposed have been told by the County Health Department to sign a paper and stay home and quarantine because you probably have it since you're exposed, do you think the numbers of positive cases in your county, how much higher than 20 might they be? We have no idea. Lisa, it's just um, because we don't have enough tests, we don't know. And that's been the problem, we don't know. But we've been saying for a long time that there's people out there, um, I've heard figures, and again, this is just what the research is starting to show, that there's somewhere probably between 25, 30% of people who have COVID-19 who, who show no symptoms at all. Gosh, think about if we had enough tests to go around and we could just do massive testing and we could find who those people are because they, under no fault of their own, could be potentially spreading it to others. And uh, they don't want to do that, but they don't even know they have COVID-19 and they're not having any symptoms, so they wouldn't be eligible for a test. But in countries where they've had plenty of test kits, that's what they've done, and that's how they've really kept the spread of COVID-19 from really ravaging their country the way it's ravaged ours. Along that same line, then, in our area, we've heard talk in other states um, about this antibody testing. Is, is any antibody testing available for people here who think they may have had a mild case or would be maybe one of those exposed family members who were never formally tested uh, to just have a comfort level of knowing I, I, I do have the antibodies, I must have had a mild case. Is that going on around here at all yet, um, either in private physicians' offices or through the county health department? As far as I know, that's not even available yet, but I could be wrong. I'm no expert when it comes to these things. Um, you know, we hope to uh, uh, maybe get our um, uh, infectious disease doctor in here with me one day, and maybe he could answer some of those more technical questions that are really out of the realm of my uh, expertise. So I don't really want to speak All to right, something okay. I really know very little about. Well, one more thing on the resources uh, question. We, we heard Governor Cuomo in New York State talk about the fact of today that the state of Oregon is going to um, give New York some of I'm, I'm New having York trouble hearing you, Lisa. I'm, you're, I'm, you're kind of garbled. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try again. How about now? A little bit better. Um, we know that uh, Oregon is giving New York State some of their ventilators, and our State Secretary Rachel Levine was asked, I think, that question today, uh, but I, I think she, she thought maybe she was being asked whether Pennsylvania would try to borrow resources from other states. I think maybe the question was, would Pennsylvania loan any resources to New York State if we have excesses that we don't need yet? Um, do you have any information on whether any of our hospital systems would be looking to do that? I have no information on that. And again, that would be a conversation had at that hospital system level, which uh, we would not be privy to in the Erie County Department of Health. Jet TV? Yeah, hi, Kathy. I apologize. I, I uh, Just to clarify, can you recap and update on any of the previous cases and if the 40-year-old, this newest case, was travel-related or contact? So we're still doing the uh, investigation on our newest case, so I don't have any further information on that. And um, I don't have any further updates on any of our other cases. Um, as far as I know, everyone is convalescing well 
uh, at home, and then there was the one that that was uh, taken to the hospital, and um, I believe is still there. But honestly, I'm not even really positive. But we have, uh, you know, um, kept in track with all of the people who are at home. Right, right. And then you um, kind of recapped, I guess, the what happens whenever you are quarantined with the health department and signing the paper. So I guess after your 14 day. Uh, quarantine process and then you're uh, symptomatic free for those three days. What's the next step for those people who were COVID-19 positive? That's where kind of uh, those new, those oldest cases are kind of reaching that deadline now. So there's two different things here. There's isolation. Isolation is for the person who we know is COVID positive and they are isolated um, and they shouldn't even be with the people in their home. So we tell them to find a, you know, hopefully they have a place in their home where they can have their own bathroom their own room and that the people that they live with would provide them meals but just bring it to their door leave it and then not go in the room with them so that is what is um, an isolation situation once they have been symptom free for 72 hours then they are free to go out for life sustaining needs they could go out and get groceries for example for the household um, if you are in close contact with somebody who has COVID-19 and that very well be a spouse or a child or or someone who lives in that house with that person you would be quarantined for 14 days which means you would stay in your home and away from any public um, any public connection you know so you wouldn't be going to a grocery store or a pharmacy or any place like that for 14 days and uh, if after 14 days you have no symptoms, then you're like the rest of us. You are able to go out for life-sustaining needs. And now we're asking everyone to wear a mask. Hope that answers your question. Yep, thanks. Airy Times News. Uh, Kathy, are there any other safety measures that you are considering right now for the public that the public could adopt to further safeguard the spread of the virus? Stay home, stay home, stay home. That is the best tool we have. Um, it was actually the tool they used in the 1917s, and it's really the best tool we still have today. There is no magic bullet out there. There is no vaccine. There is nothing better for us in terms of stopping this spread than for us to stay home, to stay physically distant from anyone that we do not live in our home with. Um, now we know not everyone can do that. Some people have to go out and go to work to take care of us, uh, to sell us the groceries, to sell us, you know, the uh, pharmaceuticals that we need and such. So for those people, wear a mask, wash your hands frequently, keep your hands away from your face until you've washed your hands again completely. And again, keep yourself at least six feet away from anyone you come in contact with while you're out. Those, they're, you know, we keep talking about those things. There's nothing new. There's nothing different in that regard. Um, we know that social, physical distancing is our best tool. And if we had a way that every person could just stay in their house for two weeks, I'm talking about every single person, which we know is not possible, this virus would go away because it wouldn't have a place to live. But that can't happen because obviously there's people who have to go to work to keep you know, our water working to keep us healthy if we have to go to the hospital, you know, to keep us fed. So unfortunately, not everyone can do that. But the more of us that can do that should do that. Stay at home as though you're staying, as, as though someone's life depends on it. Stay home as though someone else's life depends on it. And someone else's life does depend on you staying home. Takiri, do you have any last questions? Just very quickly, ma'am, I just had a, uh, I, I dug into the data a little bit and saw that Luzerne County, which is only 40,000 more people than Erie County, has 648 cases and five deaths. We have now 20 cases, no deaths. Um, uh, you know, that's the home of Wilkes-Barre. It's, 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 it's a very similar county to us. Any idea why they would have so much more than us? Well, I think it's a few different things. One, we took early and strong action in Erie County, and the people in Erie County have responded to that. 
And so that, I think, is one of the best things we have done to keep us where we're at. And we have a very, very skilled uh, set of people working on this, both from our public health department and from our public safety department. And both of those departments have been working diligently together along with a lot of other partners. And so public health is important. We're looking at the population health and we got on it fast and we said, look, we've got to shut things down. We've got to get people to stay at home. We've got to make sure that our businesses are compliant. As soon as Governor Wolf gave that order, we got on it with an enforcement team. Not everybody liked that. Um, some people thought we were too heavy handed. But I look back at that and I say, these are the things that we did that made a difference in Erie County versus other counties. There are other things. Um, you know, we do think that part of the reason the east part of the state may have some higher numbers, maybe just because of the number of people from the really hard hit area of New York and New Jersey who have a strong connection to the eastern part of Pennsylvania, whether they have a second home there or family. So we know that people moving around is a big way that this is spreading, people moving from community to community. So that's why we've said, if you come back here, you should be quarantined for 14 days. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. And so we now give out instructions to anyone getting off a plane, a train, a bus into our community, uh, telling them they should quarantine themselves for 14 days, as well as other instructions. So uh, we're going to continue to be strong in our message about this. Um, this is very, very, very serious. And the only way that Erie County is going to continue to stay in the trend that we're in is if every person listening and every person not listening continues to help us do this. So this community has come together, partnered with all of us, and we're making it happen here. And so those are the reasons I think that we continue to see our numbers just slowly creeping up instead of these big surges that unfortunately too many of our counties have seen. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Erie News Now, do you have any final questions? Yeah, one last quick thing. You talked about essential uh, doctor's appointments that might need to be face to face, especially for senior citizens if they're called to one of those appointments that's deemed essential. Is there any renewed advice um, for, for them or for their doctors when you aren't socially distancing because somebody's having to examine you? So again, you're a little hard to understand, but I think your question is if somebody has to go out, in particular our seniors who have to go to a doctor's appointment, is that, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Well, um, first of all, make sure you have a phone conversation with your doctor's office to make sure you, you must come in. Uh, if you are able to do telemedicine, many people are now finding that to be a wonderful way to communicate with your physician without having to go out of your home. Um, I know not all of our senior citizens have the access to the internet uh, and that's um, unfortunate that telemedicine is a phone call though. Make sure that your physician knows you're coming. Wear a mask. If you have um, any kind of uh, a compromised situation, hopefully you already have a surgical mask, but otherwise a homemade mask is better than no mask. So put on a scarf, a bandana, whatever you have and cover your mouth and your nose as you go to that appointment. Um, try to keep yourself uh, as socially distant from anyone in the doctor's offices I know are trying their best to do this while people are in there. Uh, make sure you wash your hands well uh, while you're there, certainly when you uh, leave there um, 20 seconds at a minimum. And do all those things you do uh, that we tell you to do and don't put your hands anywhere near your face because that's how you can take that virus off of a surface and transfer it into your body. That we get in through your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And so please keep your hands away from your face. And that's sometimes hard to do. And actually when you're wearing a mask, sometimes it can be a little harder. So be careful when you're wearing those masks that you also remember to keep your hands away from your face. Thank you. Uh, Jet TV, do you have any final questions? Yeah, just one more question. So how this, I guess, would uh, be more along lines for the health department to answer, but uh, we'll just see if you can do it. So how confident are they that uh, Erie's ahead of uh, community spread and keeping uh, COVID-19 from spreading within the community? We have seen no signs of community spread yet in Erie County, and um, that's a really good 
place to be at this moment when we see what's happening in so many other communities. Uh, as we've mentioned before, we had one that we called community acquired. Um, we couldn't quite determine where that person had acquired the COVID-19 virus, but a community spread issue we have not seen. And so we feel very confident that we are ahead of the curve compared to so many other communities, particularly communities of our size. And uh, we're going to continue pushing hard to stay that in that place ahead of the curve on this and keeping what we do, what we call flattening that curve down and keeping our community safer. I know this is very difficult. All of this physical distancing, social distancing is difficult. Not seeing your friends and your loved ones, not uh, being able to play with your grandchildren, not being able to go see your grandparents or your, your parents who may be elderly, but all of this is helping to keep our community safer and healthier, especially for those people who are most vulnerable, our elderly, our people who have underlying conditions, our, our youngest among us. So thank you again for everything you're doing. Uh, please enjoy the sunshine this weekend. It helps all of us to lift our spirits. And I ask all of you to please stay home, to stay safe, and to stay calm. And you've been watching today's update on COVID-19 from County Executive Kathy Dahlkemper. In case you just joined us, here are some highlights of the update. Uh, she told us we have one new case in the county, bringing our uh, sto total to 20 uh, positive cases. That person, uh, she said, is in their 40s, and it's currently being investigated by the Erie County Department of Health. And she also mentioned that... Uh, as of right now, there are no signs of community spread in Erie County. And as far as uh, the state she mentioned, we now have 136 deaths in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, we've had 34 deaths in the past uh, 24 hours and she did a lot of reiterating from uh, Governor Wolf talking about you know the best thing to do to stay safe is obviously stay home but if you do go out um, you know take every precaution um, use uh, some sort of uh, a homemade mask there are actually directions to make one on the uh, state and the uh, county website and she mentioned that uh, medical masks are in short supply and they should be left only for uh, medical professionals or um, people with certain underlining uh, diseases. So as of this afternoon, here are the latest on the confirmed cases of coronavirus near us. Right now, there is one new case of COVID-19 in Erie County, bringing the total number of cases to 20. Crawford County reports five cases. Warren County has one case and there are 13 confirmed cases reported in Chautauqua County, New York, and one death, and 11 confirmed cases in Ashtabula County, Ohio. Across Pennsylvania, there are over 10,000 positive cases of COVID-19. 136 people have died, and more than 60,000 people have tested negative. And the best advice is stay, to stay safe is stay calm, stay home, and wash your hands often, and practice social distancing of at least six feet. And we'll have a complete wrap-up tonight on Jet 24, beginning at 6. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Wilk. Good afternoon. This has been a Jet 24, Fox 66 special report. For ongoing developments, log on to YourEerie.com. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming.